Hello, everyone, <laughs> friends, lovers. Hey. Welcome, welcome to Five Minutes with Robert Nacer. Dancers, welcome, dancers. Dancers. I was getting my shoulders into it with the music. That's right. Because what did we say? Dance. And if you can't dance, do it anyway. D- dance anyway. Yes. Hello there. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. It is Sunday, May 3rd, 2020. <laughs> Holy heck. You, you sound frazzled. The 124th (laughs) day of 2020. Yeah? Only 236 days left until Christmas. We're sprinting towards it, man. 181 days until Halloween. Mm -hmm. And we've got a lot to cover today, so we're going to need you to listen fast. So, on this day in history, Niccolò Machiavelli was born. Hooray! (laughs) Happy, unhappy birthday. Author of The Prince, that's right. Which gave us such great expressions as the ends justify the means. Oh, so sexy. (laughs) Not everything that he wrote was like what he wrote in The Prince. You know, this was advice for this prince character. So it wasn't all that bad. And he managed to get his book into... The Catholic Church's Index Librorum Prohibitum, the Index of Prohibited Books. So is burned. So there's a virtue right there. That's great. Well, we talked last week about pretzels. You know, it was National Pretzel Day. And pretzels were popular because the Catholic Church didn't ban flour, salt, and water, Mm -hmm. unlike everything else that was banned over the Lenten season. So basically, they banned the book. So pretzels, okay. Machiavelli, not okay. Not okay. Simple. Unhappy birthday to Machiavelli. Well, as he a, would want it. That's right. Well, again, he wasn't <laughs> all Machiavellian. He was also Niccolo E. N. Or something. <laughs> also on May 3rd in 1933, mm-hmm. a far more important birth, the Godfather of Soul. James Brown says, I got you. Link to that song and more information in the show notes. That's right. The hardest working man in show business. Yep. And today, the national holiday of the week is Lemonade Day, the first Sunday in May. And depending on how uh, how they're celebrating it, it can be the whole week. So put up your lemonade stand. Today we're drinking uh, lemonade grapefruit juice. Mm. Oh, we're going to do a lemonade stand? Are we opening it tomorrow? That's the, uh, you know, like right outside of... Uh... Linda and Quaint Cordaire's art gallery. That's in right. Na- in Napa Valley when they're opening tomorrow. <laughs> I was going to mention that later, but I'll mention it right now. Excellent. Because right the- now, yeah. while you're listening to this podcast and you're sitting in front of your computer, go to Cordaire.com, C O R D A I R.com. Because Quentin and Lauren- Linda Cordaire not only run the finest art gallery in the United States, they're opening the doors for business tomorrow in Napa Valley. Yes. They should have a lemonade stand outside of their business. And they should have a lemonade really stand fun, outside. There's a, there, there you are. There's, there's free... Uh... I wonder if you can get shut down for running a, a lemonade stand mm-hmm. these days. Because, <laughs> you know, we don't do a lot of current events. We tend to keep it a little broader than that. But but what Quentin and Linda Cordero are doing is so awesome that yes. uh, you need to check that out. Look them up on Facebook. You can read their letter to the community letting them know, hey, yeah. we get it. Serious business. Pandemic. Yep. We absolutely take things seriously. Precautions and masks and sanitizers and only but six people in. But you can't keep everybody shut down forever. Right. You can't just uh, have people lying around like hamsters in your, your habit trail. See, I've been, I've been avoiding this topic, but but <laughs> because there's so many people who are, you know, one side or the other of the issue, there's that three-way Venn diagram of, I'm for the economy and I'm for individual rights and I believe the virus is serious and... This idea that you can actually do all three. Well, Linda and Quint have it right yeah. in every way. Mm-hmm. And they are willing to put their their lives and their liberty on the line. Yes, and Linda, as a matter of fact, says hello to us. And she thinks that the lemonade stand is a great idea. Oh, I wish so, we'd go to Cali and I know, it'd be so nice. bring our lemons along. <laughs> Let's hop in the car right now. <laughs> I should have added a little alcohol to this. We can drink in your honor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, I've got uh, Axton's Diner. Axton's Diner. I don't know if you can see that actually, but it says Axton's Diner. <laughs> yes, we can see it. Well, we take your word for it. Mm-hmm. Depends on how good folks' internet connection is. This could look great on our end, but fuzzy on you. You never know. Anyway, with that out of the way, are five minutes up yet? 
The podcast of the week. What are we listening to? I'm listening to Brene Brown's Unlocking Us, and I haven't decided on it yet. So if anybody else is listening to Brene Brown, let me know what you think mm. of the podcast. I've just got into it. All right. Um, I've heard good things. I haven't read it yet. So since I have no verdict yet, what I can recommend is the episode of the Tim Ferriss Show that Brene Brown announced her podcast on. Nice. That you should listen to. Um, the episode was called Striving Versus Self-Acceptance, Saving Marriages, and mm. More. And that was an outstanding episode. Episode 409 of the Tim Ferriss Show. Link to that is in our show notes. Give that one a listen. But if anybody has a verdict already on Brene Brown's show, it could be outstanding or it could be a train wreck. Or it could be something in between or just kind of No, nice. it's going to be one of those two. Oh, really? <laughs> and it, that kind of describes this episode of 5 Minutes with Robert Mason, too. As I announced on Facebook, the topic is fraught. And I don't even know what fraught means. It's um, a little little complex. It's a little bit of... Um... Risky business. And we're all about risky business. That's right. Take chances. That's right. That's right. Uh, so, um, da -da 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 -da. before the podcast of the week, I need to repeat a recommendation. Mm -hmm. Last week, we discussed trust and forgiveness, okay. including yep. Gina Gorland's talk on self-honesty. Well, this week, coincidentally or serendipitously... Serendipitously? I like serendipitously. Serendipitously? Except yours might actually be a word, so maybe <laughs> maybe that's a bonus there. But this weekend, and I'm sure it wasn't inspired by us, but the coincidence is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Jean Maroney's latest Thinking Directions newsletter that came by mail includes her post, How to Forgive Yourself. What? And if that inspired anybody to do a podcast or anything like that, you're welcome. Anytime. <laughs> Yeah. Well, the link to that is in the show notes. You don't need to be subscribed to her newsletter because it is linked as a blog post. But you should be subscribed to her email newsletter just because yes. it's way awesome. It's valuable. And speaking of last week's show on trust and forgiveness, mm -hmm. I mentioned two more ideas which bring us to this week's show. One was the perspective that love, as well as trust and forgiveness, are a kind of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Like trust and forgiveness, there's an evaluation in love, a factual evaluation that is open to thought, understanding, validation, and constancy, which we've mm. talked about. That like consistency? No. No? The idea here is once you've figured out that you love someone, mm -hmm. you can act on that evaluation even when you don't feel the emotion. When you're angry or distracted or frustrated or whatever causes the emotion to wax and wane, mm -hmm. there should be a constancy to your emotions. You should know what you feel and why so that as those changes occur over time, you know what your actual evaluation is and not just what you feel in the moment. That is excellent advice, Robert. Yeah. Consistency is what you don't get because emotions, again, they wax and wane. They come and go. That's true. Life throws stuff at you that has an impact on that automatic mechanism that is so, the emotional mechanism. So you have to, so what you're saying is that you need to explicitly define why you do love somebody. And, yes, and you what, need to uh, know. Yes, just like you need to know what you know and why, mm -hmm. you need to know what you feel and why. Yes. How you evaluate and why. And that was the first thing that we brought up last week. But the second one was the notion of unconditional love. Yes. Unconditional love. And as soon as we said that expression, <laughs> I could just hear the hear, hear bombs the, going off the, and, could, and my friend's the, list going away. The and cringing. The cringing. <laughs> People are cringing. Well... Consequently, the word of the day is love, mm -hmm. and we are using the objectivist definition to love is to value. Love is a response to values, mm -hmm. and I'll bring an additional quote in for clarification by Ayn Rand. Love, friendship, respect, admiration are the emotional response of one man to the virtues of another. The spiritual payment given in exchange for the personal selfish pleasure which one man derives from the virtues of another man's character. That might sound circular, to love is to value. Well, then what is it to value? 
Well, to value, value is that which one acts to gain and or keep. Oh, you go out and get those values. And virtue is the action by which one gains and keeps it. Mm -hmm. Now we could have a long discussion about... So, so what you're saying, wait a minute, the virtue is kind of like the method of going out and getting what you, what you want and what you need and what you love? That's right. Okay. That's a different that's way right. of saying virtue. That's a different way of... You know, it is. Yeah, different it perspective is. Yeah, I guess that. we take that for granted. But some mm -hmm. people might be saying, I thought virtue is whatever your pastor tells you to do. Yes. Or whatever your parents told it's you to do. It's how you obey the authority. What your college professors <laughs> told you to do. No. But... <laughs> Pashaw. 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 It's actually a good part of your character. That what's right. what motivates you. Virtue is the action by which one gains and keeps one's values. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So since we mentioned unconditional love, mm -hmm. the first question is not what is unconditional love, but why does this even come up? <laughs> Where'd this come from? And we gave some of the answers last week. There are contexts in which love needs to be, well, for now we'll call it unconditional. Okay. And we mentioned children. And so I couldn't resist afterward looking up, well, has anybody said anything clarifying this on this that I haven't already said, as if that's not enough. And among other things, I came up with Leonard Peikoff's podcast in which he was asked about unconditional love a couple different times. But there you go. You struck it. Struggle rich. So I'll link to those uh, podcasts, those MP3s on uh, in the show notes. Mm -hmm. But just real quick, he was asked: Is unconditional love, for example, for a child, irrational? How can a small child have the virtues required to deserve love? And Leonard answered in part: No, unconditional love in these circumstances is certainly not irrational. It's fine. What then? has the child done? What is in him to deserve love? And this was a uniquely Leonard Peikoff answer. Mm -hmm. I think his value is being you. Being you in part, being created by you, reflective of what you are. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what you see in him. And he deserves love for that reason. Now, I would go even broader, and I suspect Leonard would too. Excuse me, Dr. Peikoff would too. Yeah, those of us who studied Leonard Peikoff for so long yeah. get into falling him, calling him by his first name, even though that's a little over familiar. Because, mm -hmm. you know, nobody talks about Ayn Rand and says, well, what Ayn would have said. And when I run into people who do that, it sounds presumptuous as hell. So <laughs> I really should say what Dr. Peikoff said. Say Miss Rand or. Yes, yes mm -hmm. that's right. But as a matter of speaking of what Ayn Rand would say, yes, um, I like this one. Uh, one gains a profoundly personal, selfish joy from the mere existence of the person one loves. Kind of uh, leads us, I think, farther here. Well, we talked about that last week, too, in that love is a response to values. Mm -hmm. That means love isn't something you get or give so much as something that you experience, mm -hmm. something you think and feel. And so you can love somebody who cannot return that love. Uh, that's how you can have unrequited love, but it's also how you can have hero worship, how you can love uh, uh, other heroic people, whether it's celebrities or politicians or, or healers or, you know, ideally scientists and inventors and innovators and mm -hmm. great men of history. Sorry, I can't let the uh, lemonade... Uh, be neglected. It's too too much of a value. That's right. Yes. Um, in going through then notes on unconditional love, I was looking up instances of of that in Ayn Rand's journals, and she wrote, "It is the idea of love as alms that leads." This is back to children. Leads to the idea of parents' love for their children as a generous sacrifice. Mm -hmm. But if the parents get no happiness out of their love for their children, right. their sacrifices of no use, right. and their vicious parents, other yeah. things being normal, if they do not get personal happiness and their love is authentic, well, then they'd better stop prattling about self-sacrifice. Yes. So there's our first instance in which the, the concept of unconditional love um, 
actually applies in a rational way. Mm-hmm. You cannot successfully raise a child saying, I'll love you if you're good enough. Right. That's... I'll love you if you prove to be lovable. That is manipulative and mean, is and, what that is. Yeah, well, yeah, and it wouldn't be successful in any way. No, it's it horrible. <laughs> it would be terrible. Even even the typical induction of guilt, I want you to be a doctor, why are you learning to play guitar? Mm-hmm. Um, if you were to say to the child, I will love you more if you're a doctor, I can't even imagine a good result coming of mm-hmm. that. And not just because of guilt, but just it's heartbreaking. Right. The very notion of that. I mean, if you want your child to resent you and dislike you, <laughs> there you go. Yes. That's what you do. Um, and so Jennifer has a question. After a child grows up, would you judge them objectively? And which no. I think, okay, there you go. Here's Actually, the yes. But I don't, th- I don't think it's non-objective to, uh, right. to experience unconditional love for your child. Mm-hmm. By the time we're done talking about the subject, hopefully I'll be able to justify that conclusion. But I don't think it's non-objective to experience um, such an abundance of love for your child that there's almost nothing they could do to ever lose that from you, mm-hmm. which is really what we're talking about, as yeah. we mentioned it last week. Yes. So it's a great question. Because as your children grow up, you do start to judge them more as independent people and less as uh, an extension or part of your own life. So it is possible to have a falling out. I still think it's enormously difficult and terribly tragic Mm -hmm. when that happens. And and the default condition is going to be, at minimum, a a sense of um, familiar love, familial love and camaraderie. Mm -hmm. And Jim says, and if you want your child to change, it only means that you don't accept them for who they are. So, well, yeah, yes, mm-hmm. exactly. And here we're not talking about changes and stop leaving your room such a mess, uh, but to change fundamentally who they are and what they want out of life, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that leads to uh, Robert on his notes says, Amy on tough love. <laughs> So this is my love. reminder that Amy has some excellent things this, to say about I'm tough gonna love. I'm going to have to be a little brief because this is kind of its own topic. And yeah, we could probably spend five minutes on that. There's all sorts of interesting, um, you know, twists and turns and, you know, interesting ways that a lot of people see this. And uh, basically my definition is um, it's basically when you're trying to convince somebody to improve themselves, say a child or your partner or your friend or your parent, your partner Mm. Mm. (laughs) Um, and it goes beyond just trying to you know rah 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 encouraging them to do what's right it's um it's something that is uh very difficult because um you're basically emotionally you're so emotionally invested in the outcome um, when you have a close relationship such as um, a parent to a child or a partner um that uh, it becomes very difficult to to stay objective and to see the larger picture and to be patient. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I looked some things up online, which we'll have uh, a link to in the show notes of a, a, a good, good YouTube video on it. Um, but it's basically, what the bottom line is that um, it's hard actually, it, it's, it's more difficult in a lot of cases to keep yourself objective and keep your keep your emotions in check while you're doing this kind of thing um if you're dealing with a you know whoever you know child or say a child for instance um then and to 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 keep referring back to yourself and asking yourself check in with yourself you know uh, about your emotional state and uh, making sure that you don't give in to pressure and make sure that you set clear boundaries that both um, you know you and your child understand or you and your partner understand um, that's very difficult um, because a lot of people just go into the situation where they become an authoritarian they become a nagger um, a complainer e- even a manipulator which is no good um, so tough love is I just wanted to kind of mention it here a little bit because it's um, it takes a lot of patience and it takes a lot of understanding and it takes a lot of clear thinking. Um, so yeah, um, 
that's that's basically my take on on tough love it's if, if you really want to um because because it's not in everyday life it's not something like gordon ramsay does on um, kitchen nightmares <laughs> you don't go in and you know he he has a whole pattern he has a whole shtick every time he does an episode where he comes in as the role model people actually do want his help but they don't exactly know how, and he, he might um, come up against a lot of conflict with people, but he uncovers the facts for them. And then he eventually teaches them things and actually helps them see the best within themselves. So the idea of you know tough love, if you're, tr if you're not satisfied with your relationship with another person, whether that's a friendship or a romantic relationship or a child relationship, um, it takes a lot of thought and a lot of planning and a lot of um, constancy and consistency. So let's see, do we have um, any questions here? Oh, people are being super sweet in the comments. Oh, thank you. Yes. Yeah. So Although we need more people on YouTube because Bonnie uh, mentioned, where is everybody? Yes, we need more people on YouTube. But, that, but, I, but I love the Facebook comments. Here. I love it. I love it. Yeah, and Jennifer says, um, you know, in terms of loving a uh, child, unless they do something really bad. You know, of course, if they're a serial killer, perhaps you might think to yourself, oh, uh, you know, I can't, I can't quite feel that same The tragedy thing. of an unlovable it's very, child. very tragic, yeah. Which would generally mean a psychotic child mm -hmm. is, is real but rare. Yeah and not generally the kind of circumstance we're talking about. Right. It's entirely possible you could have a child who is, who is so vicious. That is, and, it, and to be vicious and to be a child, they would have to be mentally ill. To be evil requires a certain level of maturity unless something's just wrong with your mind. Mm -hmm. But it's possible, but again, it's extremely rare, and it's generally not what we're talking about. Yeah. When folks complain that their child is unlovable, it doesn't generally rise to that level. Right. Um, and it, it, we need to make it clear, I think, take a moment to say, when we talk about unlo unconditional love for a child, mm -hmm. that does not mean that you don't express disappointment. Right. That you don't use discipline. Um, you know, you wrote down a bunch of specifics about tough love. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to get into those or not, but... Um, yeah, just, just the bottom line is that you need to be kind, but stern. You need to be consistent, but also show that you love that child, you okay. love that person. And in the context of tough love, I've mentioned this before, but I should say it again because it's worth repeating. When you are deciding the approach to take with somebody who you believe needs direction or correction, realize that some people need a drill sergeant. But some people don't. A drill sergeant will break a certain type of personality. You won't do them any good if they're huddled in a corner crying. Right. Some people need a drill sergeant. Some people need a coach. Some people need a mentor. Mm -hmm. A few people out there need an example. Mm -hmm. And some people need uh, room. And Space, you think? The challenge with tough love is knowing what is appropriate within the circumstance. And the, the short answer is judge the context and act accordingly. Mm -hmm. So, unconditional love, why does the topic even come up? We see how with children you need that concept. But what about in romantic love? Yeah, what about in romantic love? You know, Ayn Rand had a concept. She brought it up in the Fountainhead, but it's also in her journals that love is exception making. That's an interesting way to put that. And I would love to know for folks who've read The Fountainhead or are familiar with these ideas, what do you take that to mean? Or what does that mean to you? Or does it make any sense to you at all? Um, from her journals, I'm going to quote a couple things she wrote. Love is exception making and it must be deserved. Uh, this means love must be an exchange the one who gets a personal selfish happiness out of the virtues or qualities he admires in the object of his love, and love is the payment for them. She goes on to talk about the negative interpretations of 
um, unconditional love. The vicious implications of the idea of loving everybody, mm -hmm. because what you should express to others is, and I'll quote her, not love, but a benevolent neutrality as your basic attitude toward your fellow men. The rest must be earned by them. Justice, not mercy. Okay. But that idea that love is exception making. Yeah, what does this mean? Yes. There are other part, points in her journal where, where she refers to it more as a uh, love relationship is exceptional. And, and she's made that point before that a love relationship is not like a friendship. It's, it's a difference in kind, not in degree. Uh, I looked for some clues in the fountainhead in the passages where she mentions that, and if you don't mind, and you don't, actually maybe <laughs> you do, but you have no choice. I'm just going to read real quick here. Uh, Gail Winand is talking to Dominique, uh, who is now Dominique Winand at this point in the book, and says, you're not in love with me. You've never loved anyone. And she responds, why do you think that? If you loved a man, it wouldn't just be a matter of a circus wedding and an atrocious evening in the theater. You'd put him through total hell. How do you know that, Gail? Why have you been staring at me since we met? Because I'm not the Gail whining you'd heard about. You see, I love you. And love is the exception making. If you were in love, you'd want to be broken, trampled, ordered, dominated, because that's the impossible the inconceivable for you in your relationships with people. That would be the one gift, the great exception you'd want to offer the man you loved. But it wouldn't be easy for you. And she responds, if that's true, then you, then I become gentle and humble to your great astonishment because I'm the worst scoundrel living. Love is the exception making. Mm. And there, there's a lot of context in there for those people who haven't read The Fountainhead. So but. there's a passage later on in which, uh, what's well, a bit of a spoiler? Um, you know what? I'm not going to read that. But folks who've read mm -hmm. The Hump Out and Head will know that uh, uh, Rourke tries to make an exception as well for Gail Winant. Yes, he does. And, uh, and uh, well, let me read just a bit of that. Okay. If I can do it without a spoiler. Wynand would not know that Rourke had loved him enough to make his greatest exception, the one moment when he had tried to compromise. So, love is the exception making. Yeah. I, um, can I interject? Please. All right. So, um, I went ahead and I went to Google and I asked it a question. <laughs> and the question I asked was, what um, is the definition of making an exception, right? Um, and basically it came back with, um, uh, basically it's, uh, um, You can read that. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, yeah, <it's> down here. <laughs> I no. lost my place. Um, to, to make an exception, okay, is to um, exempt that person from a general rule or practice to um, exempt them um, from a, mind, mind from a standard. Yeah. As written, yeah. I think, to make an exception for someone you love is to exempt them from the general rule or practice, from their normal behavior. To see their relationship with you in a larger perspective. Well, that's what we talked about last week. Yes. That you, you judge people in the context of, of the constancy of your evaluation, yes. the constancy of emotion. Mm -hmm. If you love someone, you treat them like you love them, even if you don't feel that love in the moment. True. Yeah, so I, I, I basically said, um, you know, it's rational to make exceptions in the overall judgment of your partner because you've learned that their character and ability to act on virtues and values is reliable. Um, your partner will make mistakes, fail and grow. But just as you do not condemn yourself for your own mistakes, you make an exception for the mistakes of your partner. Um, yeah, so. This is the opposite of a strings attached or tit for tat, power struggling relationship. That's yes. outstanding. Well, thank you. That goes into a little bit more context about the strings attached relationship concept. Mm -hmm. 
um, which I, we can get into. But yeah, I think um, you know a lot of folks have different ideas about exception making. Jim says, to me, it means that love is by definition selective. Um, I'd like for him to um, talk a little bit more about that, perhaps. Well, that, that relates to her. There are a couple times when she uses the word to mean more exceptional. But that would still kind of, well, but, but what does that oh. mean? What does that look like in reality? Yeah. Uh, Caden, hey, Caden, he says, by analogy, I think of a, a exception making as how a dog um, exposes its belly to someone they trust. <laughs> um, That's a great analogy. Yeah. Not that right. we take that literally, but I yeah. love that. Yeah. Because, because yes, we are, we are vulnerable to our romantic partners in ways we are not to other people. Except, and then uh, Jeanette says, Exception from general practice of benevolent neutrality? Yes, we're certainly not neutral mm -hmm. regarding our uh, romantic partners or even other people we love that much. Good. Thank you, guys. So what originally brought this up was not last week's show, but a post I did a couple years ago mm -hmm. in which I posted uh, the word unconditionally. Yes, I Natu remember that. Naturally, I was thinking about my wife and my daughter and my mother and all the most important people in my life are women because women are just the best. <laughs> Even though Jinx says women are the bunk. Y'all have read the early Ayn Rand, right? <laughs> Y'all have, right? <laughs> and I went back to that early post and I'm not going to read the whole thing. But it started with... And this was my thinking at the time, and I'm really still working on this, which is why I'm loving your comments, and I hope you're going to keep them coming. Unconditionally doesn't mean without reasons, nor without standards, nor without judgment. Mm. It means all of the appropriate reasons have been confirmed and validated. All of the standards have been met and surpassed, and both have been judged reliable, enduring, everlasting. Everlasting meaning for a lifetime. This comes up primarily in regard to family, especially in raising children, but also in romance and ideally in very close friendships. It's a curious fact that with kids, it's not enough to say, well, you're essentially good, so long as you're good, I'll love you. And in fact, put that way, it's not even true. Mm. If you love your children, the context for that is from the day they're born an entire lifetime to the age they're at. If you've got a way to turn that off, there's something wrong with you. Um, this was related back to my original uh, Valentine's series, Secrets of a Successful Marriage, mm -hmm. uh, which we'll do a whole show on at some point. But the day three secret was... Um, Never forget how you feel about the people you love. So this is one of your secrets for a successful marriage. Love is an emotion, but it's concomitantly an evaluation. There may be moments when you don't feel the emotion, but never ever allow yourself to forget the evaluation. Yes. If you already know the value of each person in your life, then it should be easy. Just make certain, and this is beyond romance, just make certain that whatever your relationship's ups and downs, you stay aware of that person's place in the value hierarchy of your life. Mm -hmm. If you've never consciously, conceptually thought about the measure of the importance of your spouse or your parents or your kids, your friends, even your pets. Yes, that was in the notes, Caitlin. Show that belly. Even cats? Well, no, but... <laughs> But other pets, yes. Caton, he doesn't like cats. I'll Smart man. That. Achoo. No, I love cats. As long as they keep their distance. Yeah, as long as they're 50 feet away. If you've never consciously, conceptually thought about the measure of the importance of your spouse mm -hmm. or your parents, your kids, your friends, or your pets, then it's important that you do so ASAP. That means now. Yes. <laughs> as yes. scandalously as possible. <laughs> It's unfortunate that some will use the expression unconditional love in this overly literal, mm -hmm. out-of-context manner as a demand to judge not and be not judged, which ultimately means to love not and right. be not loved. Right. I mean, what's, what's love without evaluation? 
What's, what's love if you're just unthinkingly going through the motions? Yes. Happily, Yay. we can say pshaw to all of that. <laughs> we can, and we do, mm -hmm. refuse to sacrifice the best, most charming uses of the English language. That's what I wrote two years ago. Thank you, Robert of well, 2018. Well, now I'm rethinking that. Oh, yeah? Would it be worth letting go the, the expression unconditional love if we can figure out a better, more accurate way to represent it? That sounds like a good idea. If we can value without saying, oh, the value's not based on anything. Right. It doesn't okay. have to mean that, but there is that meaning that's out there. Yeah. So my conclusion is we talk about unconditional love, meaning love that is, well, we talk about it as unconditional or boundless or transcendent. Mm -hmm. And all of those can hit you and they have meaning. And if you interpret them benevolently, um, they can be good and important concepts. But I would love to know in the comments or in the uh, Five Minutes with Robert Nacer Facebook group conversation afterward, how do you think about that kind of love mm -hmm. that is unconditional, but only because of the conditions have already been met? Or is boundless, but only because it goes beyond any bounds of a lower type friendship or casual relationship. And is transcendent, but only because it transcends the need to constantly reevaluate or justify it. Mm -hmm. You know, perhaps we could better think of that kind of love as uh, integrated love or integrated love? love that is part of you and what you are and your it's life's experiences good. and your values. Right? All-consuming love, um, a lifelong love, but none of those really seems to capture it. Right. I mean, you could say epistemologically validated love <laughs> so, in terms of, you know, judging by, yeah. by the methods of virtues over a long period of time. <laughs> um, so integrated or all-consuming or lifelong, to me, those are subsumed under the idea of unconditional. Again, it doesn't mean there are no conditions, no values, no standards. It just means all of those have been met. And, you know, and as you said earlier, you, it's not a, a tit for tat. It's not right. strings attached. We're way past that. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, it is interesting because I, I did a little bit of research on, uh, I found an article, which we'll have in the show notes, called Uncond Unconditional Love, How to Give It and Know If It's Healthy. And it's interesting because their concept of, of, of um, love in, in general on a day-to-day -day basis, I guess how people experience it um, without really conceptualizing it, is a tit for tat. It's a, um, you know, you've got a checklist and okay, I've got my five love languages and you know what, um, what has he done for me lately, girl, kind of thing. Um, and it is, uh, it's maddening <laughs> because it it's so concrete bound. It's so, um, it, and, and so the idea here is that it's, um, uh, you know, so, so what I wrote was instead of love as a process of loving your own sense of efficacy and virtue and thereby the similarly lovable character of your friend or partner, that's a mouthful, but uh, many see love as a tit for tat, strings attached, checklist, um, you know, where there's a pushing and a pulling um, and prove your love for me, you know, buy me flowers or however. It's a, you know, an endless uh, counting of range of the moment tasks and chores leading to an unhappy pattern of guilt and resentment, and, you know, um, and, and you go through all of this and you never realize what the foundation of love is. Um, and, uh, as we would, we would, you know, say the foundation of love is the, is the standards that you use for your own, um, loving of yourself, identifying what's good about yourself. And, uh, those are virtues. Those are your values. Um, we can get that into that a little bit further into another episode, but a lot of your virtues, um, are dependent on how efficacious your thinking is on how reality based your thinking is on how how suited you are to live in the world kind of concept. 
And if you can feel comfortable in your own skin in, in this world and you love yourself for it and you find all these values, you can find other people who, say, who feel the same way about themselves and you can actually have a very loving relationship with them, whether that's a friendship or a romantic relationship. So, yeah. So hopefully we brought a little bit of clarity to this fraught concept. Um, and whether you find my conception of unconditional love as love that has already met all conceivable conditions, useful or not, or whether it's useful but the language needs to be changed, hopefully that's got some value for you. So your assignment, because every week we have a homework assignment. Yes, we do. So your assignment is to determine what your transcendent, all-consuming values, your non-negotiable standards are, mm -hmm. and write them down. We've done something related to this before, but what yes. I want you to do is decide what language, what concepts properly reference these values, whether it's unconditional love or some other. And I'd love to know, I'd love for you to share that with us. This is a topic we will revisit mm -hmm. as we nail some of this down. Yes. It is a little unruly, but I do like well, the integrated... it's a work in progress, the, but we are making progress. Yeah, the integrated love idea. That's right. Post-it note of the week. Um, my post-it note this week is just bring it on. I may have mentioned this one before. Um, because this coming week, I'm eligible to give blood again. Mm. And I've talked about how when I give blood, I don't like giving blood. I don't like the needle. I don't. I won't even get into the details because it's dinner time for some And it folks. creeps me the heck out. <laughs> but all I have to do is look at the technician, the nurse, mm -hmm. and I don't even have to say it out loud, but just think, bring it on. And, and all the nervousness goes away. And it's a habit. It's a standing order. So anytime you catch yourself thinking, I don't want what's about to happen, try that. Just say it in your own head. Say it out loud if you have to. Say, bring it on. I don't feel brave right now, but if I did, how would that feel? Oh, wait, I do feel brave right now. Mm -hmm. It's amazingly powerful, those three words. I always thought they were silly. Um, when it was a popular expression and then it was a movie title and I'm like, eh, bring it out, but that's fake, right? No, it turns out that it can tap in you reserves that are there, that are real, that are rational. Yes. And uh, before we um, wrap up here, um, uh, Ooh, Catherine... you saw that. I meant to mention yes, that before um, we wrapped up. Catherine asks, what kind of exceptions do you make for each other? <laughs> what kind of exceptions do we make for each other? Well, you know, again, I mean, this goes back, I think we're going to talk more about love is exception making concept because I think people have a couple different perspectives going on. Um, but, you know, what, uh, what it, goodness, I'm not entirely sure how that translates in this context, but um, I, I guess what do we... All the good ones are really, really personal. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, well, we're just going to have to perhaps make a list and then oh, pick goodness. out some really personal It just seems like we should be able ones. to come up with a really charming one mm -hmm. well that's our homework for you guys yeah well one of my secrets of a successful marriage uh, if you go back to those posts on facebook again eventually that'll all end up on the podcast but one of my secrets of a successful marriage is the answer is always yes <laughs> the answer is never no yep. including you know do, do you feel up to giving me a foot rub right now uh can we afford this thing that I would like to get. Yeah, some, something and, like that. You can challenge it a little yes, bit. Yes, and we can. But, dis we have discussions. We don't just say, we're not binary. <laughs> so, for example, with Amy, life is going to tell her no all over the place and every which way till Sunday, meaning till today. She doesn't need me to say no to stuff. Mm -hmm. My answer needs to be yes. And the neat thing about that is you'll end up doing things you don't want to do. And one of the secrets to a successful life is cultivating the ability to do things you don't want to do. And eventually you can change that. You'll find you want to do many of them. And you start associating positive things with them. Um, and you might even actually start enjoying it. Yes. Whatever it is, whatever this value is. So I don't dance, but I will go out on the dance floor if Amy wants to dance. Yes. And I will do the thing that looks kind of like dancing. 
I can barely um, ice skate, but I have ice skated with Robert. Yeah, we've we've <laughs> had we've had pets in the house. We've had bunny rabbits as pets and guinea pigs and other things too. I'm not a pets person. If it wasn't for Amy, I would probably never have pets again. But we're considering getting another rabbit. Mm-hmm. There are all sorts of uh, things like that. And and it's not oh we compromise. It's more. No, the answer is yeah. always yes. And yeah, I'd like to go on the adventure with you. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. And um, there's a couple things I'd like to just briefly mention before we go. Um, in my vows to Robert when we were married, is the statement: "The day I stop loving you is the day you abandon your judgment." And that I think speaks a little bit to what we we're talking about with regard to how to judge whether or not you love somebody and whether, whether you know, you should have a, a good relationship um, and whether your, your relationship will work. Um, because if you have that understanding of um, it's not just so much about, you know, what you did on Tuesday, <laughs> it's, it's your entire character, your, as Ayn Rand would call it, the sense of life and also your, your epistemological habits, your, your thinking habits, um, how clear th- you think things through, how, um, how you approach life. And, um, so yeah, so, um, we've never abandoned our judgment. We never will. And I don't think we'll ever stop loving each other. So there you are. (laughs) And one other thing is a quote by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry. Love is, love does not consist of gazing at each other, but in looking outward together in the same direction. Like in that direction. <laughs> Just like that. That is love. Yes, it is. Living a life together. Oh yes. my goodness. <sighs> and we're going to have recommendations in the show notes, by the way, of a couple. Yes, there are a few notes we worked from that we didn't talk explicitly about. Yeah. But for example, if you haven't read *The Selfish Path to Romance* by Ellen Kenner and Ed Locke. You absolutely need you to read really that, need and it will be in the show notes. Yes. A few other of the references that we used in putting this outrageous and semi-maniacal show together. <laughs> but some reminders. Yes. This show and all the previous episodes, zero through eight, are available at facebook.com slash Robert Naser and youtube.com slash Robert Naser. It's easier to go to YouTube and like and share and do the bell thing. Amy's really pushing YouTube. Please. She wants us to monetize this show. Please, please. <laughs> well, we just need to go from something like 100 people watching to 10,000 people watching. It's not that I'm looking for, you know, extra money from anything. Any, I, I work in marketing, so... I, Amy I, does work in marketing. I, I love this. <laughs> like and share. Like and share. And if you want to show financial love, I cannot thank our patrons enough, even though I say thank that you. every time. You are the best. Hmm. So the folks who have signed up at patreon.com slash Robert Naser or people who've contributed directly at paypal.com, you're in my heart. Mine too. Yes. Almost unconditionally. <laughs> but not quite unconditionally because then it, you know, you'd have to say, well, but you don't really appreciate the actual things they do. Yes. I won't love you less if you stop, but I love you more because you started. How's that? <laughs> I gotta write that down. That sounds wonderful or horrible. I can't decide. <laughs> I won't love you less if you stop, but I'll love you. I love you more that you. I can't even. That st- you started. I can't wait to watch this video again and find <laughs> out what I say. Brilliant! And thanks for hanging in with us, guys. We're uh, a little bit past five minutes. That's right. One more reminder: go to Cordaire.com, look up Quentin Linda Cordaire, uh, Quentin Cordaire Fine Art on Facebook. Show them some love. If you got some cash, show them some sales. Yes. And uh, hopefully all will go well when they open the store back up tomorrow. And the long arm of the law will respect their independent judgment. That said, Mm -hmm. any comments we need to reply to? I think we're all set. We went a little over five minutes. (laughs) So with that, I wish you each success, flourishing, and well-earned and enduring love. Yes.